Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Julian Sage Miazza, and I'm going to be going through my VA loan training PowerPoint. So I get a lot of people asking me about the VA loan, how to utilize it while in the military, while serving active duty, uh, or if you're a veteran, or if you're um, a, re a reservist, whatever it is, if you are qualified to use the VA loan. Um, I get a lot of questions about this, so I wanted to make this video to cover basically the training that I do in person, uh, but make this readily available for those that are interested and can't meet me in person. Uh, a little bit about me, if you don't know who I am, like if this was referred to you from a friend, I'm an active duty Coast Guard member. I've been in since January 2014. I'm also a licensed realtor with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, PenFed Realty. Um, I work out of uh, the DC office in DuPont, um, but I am currently licensed in Virginia and uh, soon to be in Maryland and DC as well. I am stationed in DC um, and something a little bit about me was I was scared into not purchasing my first home at my last duty station because I didn't know about the VA loan that much and the person that I was speaking with kind of scared me into not purchasing this home because I didn't think that I was going to be able to because I wanted to be able to rent it. I didn't plan on living there for too, too long. And so he really kind of scared me into not purchasing that home. So um, from that experience, I didn't purchase a home for another like three years. And now that, you know, I am a licensed realtor and I did purchase my home using the VA loan, um, and now I know like I, I really could have bought that and I could have been a homeowner uh, back when I first started. Uh, I also am a content creator on YouTube, so I talk primarily about um, military savings and benefits. That's kind of my specialty is helping military members be able to better and further their career through saving and investing and maximizing their benefits such as the VA loan. I'm also a uh, podcast host. Um, I also do a lot of investing in the short-term rental vacation rental space. So things like Airbnb, uh, something kind of cool that I kind of dub as um, BAH hacking, which is like basic housing allowance hacking, where you know we purchased our home with the intent to be able to short-term rent it. And we've been able to cover our mortgage while using Airbnb to basically save our housing allowance. And we were able to purchase this house uh, basically for free. We, we moved in here, we didn't spend any money, we got all our money back at closing. Um, so we didn't have to put like 20% down or anything like that. And then we we're able to start paying off the mortgage through our Airbnb income. So I call that uh, BA hacking, basic housing allowance hacking, um, you know, because uh, it's a military thing to be, try to save as much as you can of your housing allowance. So it's a, just a fun little thing, a little, little interesting uh, tidbit. We're going to be just going over, uh, this is the overview of what we're going to be talking about, the benefits of home ownership, explain the home buying process, who's on your team, credit scores, how to improve them, your earnest money deposit, contingencies, and the VA loan. So part one is the home buying process. So the advantages of home ownership are really kind of, um, really kind of nice compared to just maybe renting a home. Uh, one of the big key things is the tax benefits. So you actually save uh, tax taxes on your mortgage interest, property taxes, and other expenses that are tax deductible. In my case, because I am also uh, running a business out of my basement, basically, out of the uh, uh, room that is strictly for Airbnb, we're also able to write off a lot of our utilities and a lot of our other expenses because they are technically business expenses. So we can write those off as well. One of the other things is building wealth. So when you are putting money into a home, if you're just paying someone else's rent, you're helping to build their wealth. You're increasing the equity in that person's home when you're paying that rent. As opposed to if you own, you are paying down your own mortgage and you're building equity in your home. And equity is is kind of confusing for people that don't really know what it is, but imagine it like uh, like a fluid. It's something that you can take out of your home to be able to use that for maybe furnishing things, to be able to uh, fix your home up. It, it's the money that you put into your home doesn't just sit there. You can take that out. You can put that towards another home. You can put that towards refinancing. It's, 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 it's really fluid. The other thing is appreciation. So when the value of your home 
um, increases. It, it increases over time, and your your home can actually appreciate. Lots of people they can purchase homes, and then the price increases. On the other end, though, you can also purchase a home, and the price decreases, which is called depreciation. So it's something to uh, consider. Uh, some people purchase, you know, with the intent of like kind of speculating that the market's going to increase, but it can also decrease. But as as far as real estate goes, it's it's generally um, constantly appreciating because you know. Um, that's just kind of how real estate works. Um, it's also good for building credit. So when you have something on your credit that is, let's say, for 30 years or you're paying something off continually, that is really good because that boosts your credit. That lets other other credit agencies know that you are reliable, that you're constantly able to pay your mortgage off. So you're able to be able to get more credit. You're able to get more credit cards, be able to build that into your uh, credit history as well. And then the last thing is it, it's yours. Um, you get to keep that. Nobody tells you what color to paint your walls, what to do, um, how loud you can be unless your neighbors complain on you. But it's it's generally um, really yours and you're free to do with it what you want. So the home buying process we're just going to go over really quickly. So you're going to be going through pre-approval and that's just basically where you're going to be calling your uh, different um, uh, loan officers and uh, basically loan companies and finding out if uh, how much you are pre-approved for. Um, you want to see if you're if you're eligible to be able to purchase home and for how much. Then you're going to be doing your house hunting. You're going to be looking for the house that you want, obviously. Then once you find that house that you want, you'll take your um, pre-approval and you'll. Uh, make an offer to the homeowner and they can either accept that or they can deny that or they can do a counter offer. Uh, one of the options is that they will they will give you and then you'll go to the loan closing. This whole period between house hunting, offer, loan closing, um, you know, between the offer and the loan closing can typically be around 30 to 40 days. So I recommend for people that are interested in purchasing a home, at least give it at least at least minimum is two months. You know, you could probably get by with about a month and a half if you're looking to purchase a place, but give it, you know, the, the more time, the better, but just know that, um, if, if it's too, too early that the houses might not be available, and if it's too late, then you're, you're really going to be crunching in order to just try to find a home that will suit you. So you, you, you kind of want to be in that sweet spot of around two, two and a half, three months. So now we're going to talk about the members of your team. So you're going to have an advisor, a real estate agent, lender, home inspector, appraiser, and closing agent. So the advisor is going to be someone that you trust, someone that you know, someone that can help you. Uh, sometimes that is your real estate agent. If your real estate agent is a friend or someone that you know, uh, maybe, maybe it's just someone that is experienced in purchasing homes, someone that's going to help you uh, make wise decisions. Obviously, you know, you, you, your real estate agent is going to be advising you on a lot of this, but sometimes, you know, you, you might not have a real estate agent that um, is always going to be communicative. Uh, you know, different real estate agents offer different levels of service. So um, it's always good to have a little bit of someone who can help advise you on your home purchase. Then you're going to have your lender. Your lender is going to be the person that you're going to be getting your loan from. And typically you're going to be working with a lending officer and the lending officer has different people on their team that you'll be communicating with. But the lender is also should also help you along your process. Now, one of the things, because this is a VA loan, I want to stress that a VA loan is going to be handled a little bit differently than your conventional um, your 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 conventional loan. You want to find a real estate agent that knows some of the specifics of the VA loan and as well as a lender, because lots of lenders can offer the VA loan and everybody's probably going to say that they specialize or that they, you know, they handle lots of people that. Uh, do the, the VA loan, but really finding someone that really knows about the VA loan can save you a lot of money in the end. You know, different types of uh, clauses and, and different things that you can put into your contract to be able to help you to walk away with more money is definitely good. And also your real estate agent might also know specific programs that can help military members be able to save money. That was one of the downfalls of when I was going through the process was I didn't have someone that specialized in VA loans. So there were some things that I missed out on. And it wasn't until that I got into the real estate space that I started learning about these different programs and um, things that are available to, to people that are interested in using the VA loan or that are just military. 
you're going to have a home inspector. Having a home inspector can save you a lot of money. So it's good to find someone that is reliable, someone that really knows how to do those home inspections. You want to find someone that can really kind of take that, that home apart and be able to get you the most bang for your buck because they're going to go through there and they're going to be looking through everything, just trying to make sure that everything is up to, up to, up to par, that there's no clogs, that the, the hot water is working, that there's no termites, that there's that all this stuff is here and they can document that and help to renegotiate or help to get things fixed before you move in so you don't move in and now there's a bunch of stuff broken. Your appraiser is going to be someone that is coming from the lender so that the lender uh, they basically pick from a pool of appraisers and then the appraiser will value your home. So sometimes your home can be appraised for let's say 300000 and if the home is only uh, they're selling it for let's say 280 and then it comes back appraised for 300 then okay then you're getting the home twenty thousand dollars less than what the appraiser deems that the home is worth but what can also happen is that the appraiser might say that the home is only worth 250000 and at that point your lender is only going to give you $250,000 and you have to either renegotiate on the price and maybe they can drop the price or you'll have to come up with that money yourself or you'll have to maybe get another loan, some other creative way for creative financing to be able to purchase that home if an appraiser deems that the house is not worth it. Uh, for usually on most cases the the appraisal the home is usually worth average of what the real estate agent um, said that the home is worth but sometimes the real estate agents or just the homeowner are a little bit off and that can affect you being able to purchase the home lastly is going to be the closing agent title company so the closing agent is uh, sometimes incorporated into the title company so the title company is the person that will do all the paperwork get all the all the ducks in a row and really kind of finalize everything make sure that uh, your name is appropriate wherever that it should be and they will also be conducting the closing and making sure that everything goes smoothly so that you can move in so saving money choosing a lender first you want to find out what is the rate and the APR so when you're choosing a lender you want to find someone that can give you the best rate possible. Now there's a difference between rate and APR. The rate is going to be pretty standard across the industry. So let's just say right now the rate for lenders is 3.0. You know, uh, 3.0 is what the rate is. But the APR is basically what they charge for that lender. So every lender is going to have a different APR. And the APR could be, let's say, 3.0. 2 or 3.25 or maybe 3.5 and the APR really depends on how the lender looks at you as a potential customer like if you have really good credit and or maybe you have a lot more money to put down you can get a lower APR as opposed to if you don't have such good credit and you know maybe it's just a lender that is a little bit more stringent on the criteria that they have for the people that they work with, then your APR could be more. So you really want to shop around when choosing a lender. Don't just go with your bank and just, you know, maybe get your 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 car loan, your car insurance from your, your bank, and now you're just going to get your home insurance, you know, your home uh, loan through the bank. So you really want to shop around because it can save you tens of thousands of dollars over the life of the loan. You want to get pre-approved through multiple lenders within a 45-day period. So within 45 days, you can apply to a bunch of different lenders because they are going to be doing credit pulls. Um, if you're just getting pre-qualified, they will just kind of see like without doing a hard pull on your credit. But if you're getting pre-approved, then they are going to be looking at your credit and pulling that history. So if you have a 45 day window, about 45 days to be able to reach out to a bunch of different lenders and get that um, credit pulled from them. You're also going to want to negotiate with your lenders on some of the following things such as lender service fees. This could be things like underwriting, admin, application, preparation processing, uh, credit checks, origination fees. These are things that you can negotiate with your lender. Um, there's things such as appraisals, so sometimes that they can waive the appraisal fee. Uh, um, you know, I know that lots of times real estate agents, they work with certain lenders and they can offer um, if you go through them to their loan officer, they can offer to waive the appraisal fee. And then lastly that you can negotiate is on the points. And now points is what is used to be able to deduct 
from your interest. So a point is typically going to be 1% of what the total loan amount is. Now I want you to be careful because lenders like to be able to play around with this points thing because it is kind of confusing. Um, and when you're reaching out to them, they'll say that they have like a uh, three points oh rate and then they won't tell you what the apr is so then you ask them you know well what's the apr and then they'll tell you well it's 3.2 based off of this credit and and you know but maybe they forego to tell you that you can only get to the 3.2 if you pay for a certain amount of points so you want to make sure that when you are working with a lender that you're just telling you know what what is going to be the final like you know, uh, uh, you know, wait with no points, without anything. Just what am I paying for? And they'll they they should try to give you a straight to the point answer. Next, we're going to be talking about pre qualification versus pre approval. So pre qualification is just when you're reaching out to a lender and you want to be able to get an idea for how much you you can work with. They'll basically, without doing a hard credit pull on your 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 credit, they'll they'll give you an idea. So it doesn't require a loan application. You can call anybody that is a lender and say, hey, can you pre qualify me? And they should be able to work out the numbers based off of what you give them, based off the estimates, to be able to give you an idea. Some people think that just because you're pre-qualified that you can start going and you know shopping around for a house, which is not the case. You cannot put a l offer in on a home just off of a pre-qualification letter. What you need is to get pre-approved. So the pre-approval is used to give the seller assurance that you are able to get the funding. So this is when they look at your credit, they look at how much money you have in the bank, they they go through your loan application, and now you have a letter that says that you have basically this money available and that you would be able to purchase a home with this lender based off of your pre-approval. So we're going to go over credit scores real quickly. Um, credit is a big factor in being able to purchase a home. Some people don't have the best credit and some people have excellent credit. And depending on where you are in the scale, in this scale right here, is going to help to have lenders be able to give you a better credit. Now, I do want you to understand, though, that you might just be like on the cusp. Let's say you maybe have a 680, like I had a 680 credit score and different lenders are going to have different criteria. So let's say one lender says a 680 is technically good while another lender might say 680 is fair. If you go to the lender that says 680 is good and you get a offer from them basically saying, yeah, we'll work with you and we'll give you this uh, this APR based off of your credit because you fit within a good category for this APR, you can always go back to another lender and say, hey, these guys are offering me this, so can you accept what they're offering based off of my credit score? And a lot of times they can say, yes, we can do that because they want your business. So your credit score is based off of a, a few things. Uh, the big key players are going to be the consistency of your payments, the amount that is owed, the length of your credit history, the types of new credit that you have, and the types of credit used. So the amounts that you owed. So if you have a lot of uh, credit on on certain credit cards, that can boost your utilization, which can lower your rate. Also, if you are not paying on time, that's going to affect your credit score. So really for the best rates possible that you can get, you really want to be above the 700 range. Once you start going between 650 to 700, you're going to get average ranges. And a lot of times they don't even accept you if you're less than 650 to 560. You're going to you know, maybe have to go with a much higher, higher um, rate for your for your loan, but the best is going to be between 700 to around 850, which is kind of the top. So again, here's some different things for your credit, improving your credit. This is going to be credit utilization, your payment history, any derogatory remarks, your age of credit history, and here's a nice uh, uh, um, chart that kind of shows you like you know what is good, what is what is a payment history? You know, what what is the good percentage? How much of utilization is good? How much is fair? So if you can lower it and get to these numbers somewhere over here, you'll really be looking really well from a lender's perspective. 
And just to give a little shout out to Ask Sebi, he created this chart and he's a credit card guy on YouTube that uh, I follow. Uh, he shares a lot of really good information on credit cards, improving your credit and lots of good stuff. So here's some credit card quick tips, some things that you can definitely use to be able to improve your credit really quickly. So if you call your credit card and request an increase in the credit limit, this can decrease your utilization. Now, a couple things that you want to do though, you want to Ask them if they can do this without doing a pull on your credit because sometimes if you increase your credit limit, they will do a pull on your credit, which you know ha is considered a hard inquiry and a hard inquiry is going to impact your credit if you have too many. Also, when you apply for a loan, that's going to be a hard inquiry, which will affect your credit. But just low that know that credit inquiries are on the low impact scale. Um, but too many of them is going to affect you uh, partially. So ask them to be able to do a credit increase without having a credit pull on your, your credit. But if they can increase it a significant amount and that is going to change your utilization rate, then maybe it is worth doing a hard pull on your credit to be able to increase the amount of credit available. If you become an authorized user on someone else's account, you can gain their credit limit and that should lower your utilization. So again, one of the things that affects it is how much you have on your credit card. How much credit do you have? If I have over a hundred thousand dollars line of credit and I'm using ten thousand dollars, that is not a lot of utilization but if I'm using a hundred percent of that that is or let's just say even 70 75,000 that is very poor and that's going to affect my credit but on the flip side let's say you only have five thousand dollar line of credit and you use five thousand dollars a month that's also going to be very bad so it's better to have more than you really should need don't open any new lines of credit before or during the buying process so this is going to affect your credit score and if your credit score gets affected while you're doing the purchasing that can impact the purchase of the home. And number four is always keep credit lines open. Do not close out accounts. I know a lot of people say you got to cut the credit card and credit's bad and you know don't want credit, but credit is actually a good thing and it's actually something that can be very helpful. If you do have issues with just maxing out your credit cards, then that's probably a different conversation that that you should be watching and you shouldn't really be maybe looking at purchasing a home right away you should be looking to be able to correct uh, that issue but having credit is a good thing and closing those lines of credit will lower your credit limit and the lower your credit limit goes means that your utilization will increase and that also harms your credit history so credit history the, the longer you have credit the better it is and if you have let's just say 10 credit cards and all of them are 10 years you're gonna have 10 years of credit but let's say you have a credit card you know you just get 10 credit cards in let's say a year then your credit history is going to be like one you know one month it's really going to be very low because they take the average of the amount of your credit cards. So if you have one credit card that is five years old and then you open two more credit cards just like within a month or let's say a year, your credit history is going to drop significantly because you're taking the average of all those credit cards. So that was a quick little rundown of credit and uh, some things that you can definitely benefit from. If you want to be able to check your FICO score, so FICO is the um, is what they use to be able to give your rating for your credit. You can go to annualcreditreport.com and then you can check that, your FICO score, uh, every year for free from all three different credit bureaus. So there's three different credit bureaus that, that look at your credit history and um, they basically give you a average for what your your score should be and if you spot an error on there like if someone says that you have a missed payment but you didn't have a missed payment then you want to call them and dispute that as soon as possible i use credit karma i think it's a really nice tool to be able to just track your uh, credit in real time it gives you a rundown of how many credit cards you have open how many lines of credit um, when you open them, some really, really useful information. I use this Credit Karma a lot, you know, but probably monthly to be able to just keep track of my credit, where it is. It shows you a, a kind of a trajectory of where your credit should be going. So finding your new home. So when you are ready, once you have that pre-qualification, you know, hopefully you have that pre-approval, now you can start shopping around for that home. And you can be as aggressive or laid back as you want in the buying process. 
your real estate agent is is going to tell you what type of real estate agent that they are and they might also suggest like you know well we want to work with people that typically are more aggressive in the type of uh, searching that they do because every real estate agent is going to be different you know if you're more take charge do it yourself then you know maybe working with a real estate agent that has like uh va loan experience would be good just to be able to bounce ideas off of you to be able to help you make that decision and then they can also guide you through that process um you can also use resources like um the MLS, which is only available if you're working with a real estate agent, uh, but you can use things like Zillow or Redfin. And something to just know, though, is that Zillow and Redfin aren't always up to date. So you really do want to consult with a real estate agent to check it in the MLS or the multiple listing service to be able to verify if a house is still available, if there's a contract on it. The MLS is going to be very up to date. Uh, Zillow, Redfin, they pull information uh, pretty quickly, but they aren't going to tell you all the details and sometimes it is not always up to date. Some things to consider is that not all condos are approved for the VA loan, so you have to check online if they are approved. You can do that just by doing a Google search. Uh, just look up, you know, uh, condo, VA loan, and then you should get a list of the approved ones. Or you could just ask your real estate agent if you're working with one to check if that is available. You want to act fast when the numbers make sense and you feel that it's right. You just want to move. You don't want to hesitate and be like, well, you know, I'm just going to wait a little bit because once you start noticing a home that you really like, there's probably going to be a bunch of other people that notice that home as well. And that's just kind of the way that it is a home that could be sitting on there for, let's say, six months and nobody's touched it yet. You might think, OK, well, I'll just let that sit there for a little bit. But as soon as you realize that it's like okay well this is the only home that's really available right now and you know we we like it someone else is probably thinking the same thing so just keep that in mind you have to act fast and you have to jump when it is the time to jump otherwise you're going to miss the boat and just know that taxes are going to be different in each state so being in the dc maryland virginia area we have uh, a wide variety of different states that you can choose to live in within like a 15 mile area so uh, taxes are going to be different so just keep that in mind the price of your home is going to maybe increase or de decrease depending on which state you choose to live in earnest money deposits so when i said that i was able to purchase my home without having to uh, pay basically anything i basically got the home and i got three thousand nine hundred dollars back you do have to put an earnest money deposit down this is going to be used to secure your offer that money, when you put that down, typically your earnest money is going to be 1% to 3% of the purchase price, but that 1% to 3% is used towards the closing costs. So you're not just giving the person that you make this offer on the home that money and they get to walk away with that. No, that money is used to be able to close on the home. Let's say that you give them that earnest money and now you decide, hey, you know, we really don't like this home. There are contingencies that can be put in place or even taken away depending on the offer that you're putting in to be able to safeguard you. Now there are key areas that allow you to walk away from the deal with your earnest money returned to you so it really does not cost you anything. This is going to be the most common ones are going to be an appraisal contingency, financing, and home inspection. So the appraisal contingency, let's say you decide to put an offer on a home and the appraisal comes back. Let's say the home is uh, they're asking 300,000 but the appraisal comes in for 250. If the appraisal is lower than what you initially anticipated you can walk away from the deal because it was not what you were expecting it to be because maybe you have to get more creative with your financing you might have to renegotiate so this is an opportunity for you to be able to take your earnest money deposit and walk away without really losing anything Another is financing. So let's say that the lender has an issue and that they aren't able to verify your income or whatever it is. Maybe you lose your job, you lose a leg, and you're not able to be able to afford the financing. This is going to give you the opportunity to be able to walk away because it's like, hey, I don't have the money, so I can't purchase this place. And you get your earnest money back and you can walk away. Another common contingency is the home inspection. So let's say you go through the home and then a bunch of stuff is broken and it really is more than what you anticipated based off of what the home inspector deems this is an opportunity for you to be able to walk away saying hey you know I didn't expect this home to be so broken or so messed up or you know th th there's things that we really weren't anticipating having to be able to fix because at this point they can either renegotiate with you or they can fix it but you could also walk away and just say hey this is a little bit too much for us we'd rather just move away
Now we're going to be talking about the VA loan specifically. So what is the VA loan? The VA loan is a VA guarantee. It's not literally the government giving your lender, you know, 20 percent. Um, you, you're not getting a home for 20% off. That's not how this works. But they are basically backing and ensuring that you will pay the loan off because being military, having being a little bit more reliable, they want to be able to help military members, help veterans to be able to purchase their homes. That's why this whole VA loan was created to be able to help people transitioning from their service to be able to purchase the home. That was to help uh, reinvigorate the economy to be able to get military people into homes to, you know, we're, we're not the highest paid people. So it is a way for us to be able to, uh, easily, more easily transition. Some things about the VA loan is that it can only be used for the primary residence only. Now, this is what scares a lot of people because they say, Hey, well, I want to purchase an investment property, or maybe I don't want to live in it for the rest of my life. Or, you know, maybe I want to move. Um, we're going to be talking more about that, but it is, used for primary residence only. It's also designed for move-in ready. So you can't just be purchasing a home that is totally debilitated and you need to redo the whole thing. It has to be move-in ready conditions. So that means that the uh, utilities work, that you are able to move in there and it doesn't have to be picture perfect. Like there could be, you know, walls that are kind of messed up. There could be bad carpeting. There, there might be even a little bit of water damage, you know, maybe a little bit. But if it's a fixer upper typically they're not going to be funding that if it's like if it's going to be a, a refurbished if, if it's going to be a home that really needs extensive work it, it's not designed for that type of home you're better with a conventional loan or some type of other loan that could better suit your needs for a fixer upper but this is for people that want to move into a home and take this up as like their primary residence there's also a cap of four hundred eighty four thousand three hundred fifty dollars as of 2019 so every year the funding cap increases and decreases so so every year the funding cap increases or decreases. Typically that's going to be increasing as prices of homes increase, but you are allotted $484,000 depending if you're in the Virginia area or if you're in Utah. It doesn't really matter, or Ohio. It doesn't matter where you are. You're allowed up to this amount. Here's some of the benefits of the VA loan. So the good, juicy stuff. There is no down payment. You do not have to put money down. So typically when you're doing a conventional loan or like an FHA, you're going to have to put maybe like, you know, uh, 3% or for like an FHA all the way up to like 20% for conventional it really depends on where you're going and if you don't put that full 20% down you're going to have to pay this thing called PMI which is mortgage insurance now with the VA loan because the government is backing it guaranteeing 20% guess what you do not have to pay PMI and PMI can be expensive we're going to go over another slide showing you how much you can actually save with the VA loan but just know you do not have to pay PMI so that's free like you know let's just say like a free two hundred dollars that you don't have to pay because you're not putting down twenty percent VA loans are also negotiable fixed interest so you it's not just like the VA loan says hey this is what it is and you have to just pay this price no you can negotiate on the stuff you can pay down your your interest rate it is just like a conventional loan you you have the flexibility to be able to change how much it is there's also no prepayment penalty so if you want to be able to per pay your home off as soon as possible, let's say you don't like having loans, you can do that. And there is no prepayment penalty associated with that. There's also limitations on closing costs and fees. So using the VA loan, you are not allowed to pay certain fees and closing costs that a lender might typically charge. In the case with working with me, PenFed typically charges $500 for people that are working with their agents as a fee. But since I primarily work with people that are interested in using the VA loan, they don't have to pay that fee, which is nice. It can also be reused. So this is something that a lot of people don't realize is that the VA loan is not just a one and done. You get to use this the rest of your life. And you can do this for multiple properties. So remember, we were talking about that cap of, you know, about 500,000, you know, 500,000. Let's say you purchase a home in Ohio and the home is only, let's say 80, you know, let's just say 100,000. Well, if you have a home for 100,000 and let's say you move and you purchase another home for 100,000, you could do that all the way up to $484,000. Um, as long as it's, you know, within 2019. So 
but you can reuse it multiple times. And if you sell one of your homes, that money goes back into the liquid amount that you have for the VA loan. So it's reusable. You can you can basically play around with it, kind of like equity. Like 484000 is your equity that you're allowed to move it around and play around with it, which is nice. It's also assumable. So some people, they say, hey, I want to purchase my family a home. I want to be able to purchase them a home. So you purchase that home, you live in it for a little bit, and then you maybe give that to your parents or you give that to your children. They get to keep the VA loan as as long as they do not sell the home. As soon as they sell the home, it would go back to you and you would assume that again. But if they move in or you sell it to somebody else, you can basically give it to them. But that does go back to you once they do sell the home. So here's some of the numbers, so some of the fun stuff. So let's say you are purchasing a home for $350,000. With the VA loan, zero. You're not putting any money down. If you were doing, let's say, around an FHA, an FHA is typically going to be around like 3.5% down, but let's just round this up to 5%. You're going to be paying, you know, the minimum just for a $150,000 home, $7,500. In the D.C., Virginia, Maryland area, typically the homes are going around the $300 mark, uh, somewhere between $250 to all the way up to a lot more. But let's just say around $350 is what you could expect to be paying for just 5% down. So like an FHA loan, you're going to be paying over $15,000 that you have to put down and you're still going to be paying PMI. If you're going to be doing the full 20% down to avoid the PMI, the, the mortgage insurance, for a $350,000 home, that's $70,000. So you need almost $100,000 just to be able to purchase a home to avoid PMI. Now, this is how much the PMI is. This is the it's typically going to be 0.5 to 1% of the loan amount per month. So that can really start to add up. When you have a $350,000 home, you could be spending $268 a month. That is basically saying that you are guaranteeing the uh, lender that you are going to pay it. So that doesn't that's, that doesn't go towards the loan amount. That doesn't go anything. It just goes in the lender's pocket. So that is money for the lender that you don't get to keep unless you're willing to put nearly $100,000 down on a home. So let's talk about some myths versus facts. So one myth is that the VA loans take too long to close. While the fact is conventional loans average closing is 40 days, VA loan closings is only 41 days. And this is based off of Ellie Mae data. Myth number two is that VA loans are riskier than conventional loans. While the fact is VA loans have had the lowest foreclosure rates of any type of mortgage. This is based off of the National Delinquency Survey. And myth number three is that VA appraisals tend to be more more conservative and undervalue homes. So uh, a lot of people believe that the VA loan appraisers that they always undercut VA loans and that you know if you want to get a good appraisal then you need to go with a conventional loan otherwise your home is going to be undervalued. Well the fact is there's no data that suggests that. So they weren't able to, able to uh, accrue that data because there's nothing that suggests that VA appraisals are more conservative than conventional. The National Association of Realtors shows that one in three transactions have had problems because of an appraisal. So appraisals just across the real estate in industry are really kind of uh, troublesome for a lot of people that are looking to buy, sell, and real estate agents. So it's not just a VA loan thing. Some people, it might have just happened to be that the home that they were trying to get and use the VA loan for, that it became uh, under appraised. And someone said, hey, well, it's the VA loan that's the problem. It's not the appraiser. Well, it probably was the appraiser because every appraiser is going to appraise a home differently. So who is eligible for a VA loan? If you've served six years in the reserves or National Guard, you're eligible. If you serve active duty during peacetime for 181 days, serve active duty during wartime for 90 days, discharge from service under honorable condition, or if you're a spouse of a service member who died in the line of duty as a result of a service-related injury or disability, you can use the VA loan. So some people that they are joining the military, they say, hey, well, you know, I want to use the VA loan right away as soon as I get into the military. Well, you do have to be in for 181 days to be able to use the VA loan unless you're, you know, there, there is a time of war. But as of right now, there is no war. So you're going to fall within the 181 day um, that you have to be able to meet. So in the meantime, you just have to make do with maybe renting or house hacking or finding some other way. Just know that once you reach the 181 days, then you can use your VA loan.
here's some things that you need for the VA loan. So it, the, uh, the credit score varies depending on the lender. Anywhere from 580 to 620 is going to be typically the minimum, like the bare minimum, just to even be eligible. And this is going to differ from lender to lender. So if one lender tells you, hey, you know, your credit score is too low, try another lender, try another, try another. Sometimes you might have to go with the lender that is going to charge you a higher interest rate uh, the the APR just so that you can get your foot in the door and get them to say okay and then maybe you can go to another lender say hey these guys are pre you know uh, uh, pre approved me they said that I'm good would you you know maybe match that and give me a little bit better rate so that's the way that you can kind of shop around for your lenders. If you are not active duty military, you need to have a W-2 for at least two years. You also need to have your tax return, some recent bank statements, your pay stub. So you're going to be sending your leave and earning statement uh, quite frequently if you're active duty. The last thing that you're going to want to get is the certificate of eligibility, which basically verifies how long you have been in service. If you talk to your yeoman or admin and just say, hey, can you write me up a letter that says X, Y, and Z, I've been in the service for this long, then basically that serves as a certificate of eligibility. So some VA loan guidelines is that your income must be verifiable. So if you're just a real estate agent, let's say for example, and that was my only income, that's not verifiable income um, because it, it's going to be very fluid. So having like that W-2 job is actually a really good thing when you are looking to purchase a home. You want at least two years of history of that r reliable income that basically lets the lender know that you're going to be able to pay for this loan regardless because you have that history. Uh, they do take into consideration if you have 12 months on the job, um, but it really is going to be lender by lender case. A veteran can obtain a VA loan immediately out of the military if the employment is related to the technical expertise. So if you're a IT in the military, you get out and you get another IT job. Uh, you can use the VA loan because they're going to look at that as like, okay, you're just transitioning from the military to another IT related field. So you don't need to meet that, you know, two year, 12 month minimum. You do have to explain any significant gaps in employment because they want to be able to ensure that the lender will be able to have the mortgage paid for. Uh, so you just have to verify any gaps, like if you decided to go to school or if you're using your um, your GI Bill or anything like that, just, just to be able to verify. You also want to have a debt to income ratio of 41%. So you don't want to have too, too much debt, really try to get that credit utilization down, you know, pay off those cars, just try to get your income to where it's not, you know, um, um, skewed. So here's the caveat with the VA loan. It is not entirely free. You do have to put a little bit down. Um, some things about this. So when you're purchasing your first home, it's going to be 2.15% for the VA funding fee. And different lenders can also charge different fees for that. So you want to shop around, look what the lender is charging for their VA funding fee, because maybe they have some extra fees that they roll into there uh, that they may, you know, might not tell you, they'll just try to slide it into the uh, loan estimate. Um, so the for the first one, it's going to be 2.15. And then every time after that, that's going to be 3.3%. If you do decide to put some money down, you can lower that VA funding fee. But just know that it is not entirely free to be able to use the VA funding. Some things about that though is that you can either pay for that right off of the bat. You could say, hey, I just want to pay this VA funding fee right away so that I can lower my monthly payments. Or you can have that wrapped into the loan amount and your loan will go up slightly um, over the life of the loan. But again, you can always refinance. You can do different things to be able to do that. So really, it is up to you if you want to pay for it upfront or if you want to pay for it on the back end. If you are receiving 10% disability, you are allowed to waive the VA funding fee. So if you've served in the military and you get out and you have, you know, a lot of people say like, it's very easy to get 10%. You could just say that your hearing is not the best as it used to be. And there you go. You have 10% disability and now you don't have to pay that VA funding fee. So, um, and again, this is something that follows you the rest of your life. So that is a definite benefit. If you're a veteran that's receiving a military pension from the VA in lieu of compensation, you're also exempt. Or if you're a surviving spouse of a veteran who died as a result of active duty, then you are also exempt. So some of the fees that can never be charged to a veteran that's using the VA loan is that you do not have to pay for termite or pest inspections, no septic well, you don't have to pay any mortgage broker fees. So again, like that's what I was saying, like some that typically civilians that would have to work with an agent from a uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway PenFed Credit Union, they would have to pay a fee of $500 unless they became a member. But 
for veterans. You don't have to pay that fee. There's also, again, no prepayment penalties. So here's some VA loan pro tips. So parts of Hawaii, California, D.C., they have higher limits up to $726,525. Now, this is really nice because these areas are going to be more expensive. And if you live in a more expensive area, your VA loan limit can increase. And if you do go over the limit, let's say you are living in Virginia and they don't have that higher limit of $726,000, you can go over your VA loan limit. If you if you are only eligible for that $484,000 limit, you can do what's called a jumbo loan where they tack on basically an additional amount to be able to cover the rest of the loan. So let's say you're trying to purchase a home that's 600000 and you only can, let's say you maxed out your loan at the total amount. You're able to put down this thing called, you know, it's called a jumbo loan and basically you put 25% down to cover the, the amount that was between the cap and the new amount that you're requiring. So let's say, you know, let's just use nice round numbers. It's a $500,000 home that you're looking to purchase. Let's just say that the VA loan is 500000 for the cap and you're looking to purchase a $600,000 home. You could purchase that home still using the VA loan and only have to put 25% down for the extra 100000 So you'd put $25,000 down and you'd be able to create this thing called a jumbo loan uh, still utilizing your VA loan and being able to just wrap that into one. The jumbo loan limit does go up to $1 million. So if you're looking to purchase homes that are more than a million dollars, well, maybe you don't need the VA loan to be able to purchase. Maybe you should be looking elsewhere, but it's for up to $1 million. So any extra seller concessions can be rolled into outstanding debt. So this is why I said it's so important to have a real estate agent that really knows about the VA loan and knows about some of the little intricacies and some of the things that uh, a regular real estate agent wouldn't know. Uh, one of the things that really would have helped me out and that would have been really nice is that I had extra money during the closing. So, you know, because I got more money back at closing than I had initially put in, uh, just because when we structured the deal, uh, we were able to have the seller be able to pay for most of our closing costs. So at the end, when we were filling out the paperwork, I was able to get more money back at closing than I had initially even put in. But because we didn't have the the verbiage in the contract to be able to do anything with that money, that extra money had to just go into paying down the loan or lowering the interest rate. And, you know, it, it would have been nice to be able to maybe just take that and put that towards paying off a car or paying off any credit card debt or anything like that. You know, that extra few hundred dollars or let's say thousand dollars, I felt would have been better well spent on other things than maybe paying down the loan or maybe lowering the interest rate just a few dollars. So this is a big one is that you only need to have the intent to move in. So if you remember in the beginning of this this training that I was saying that I was scared into not purchasing my first home because the uh, VA rep, the lender said, oh, you have to move there. You have to live there. And you know, you're not supposed to be able to rent it out, blah, blah, blah. I didn't, I didn't know any better. I didn't know anything about the VA loan. I didn't have somebody that could help me to understand it. And so I just said, okay, I'm not going to purchase that property. Had I purchased that property, had I known what I know now, you know, that property has just increased a lot and I I would have been able to have a renter in there paying that down. Really, that place would have been able to uh, be a, a very nice source of passive income. But because I was scared into not doing that, I was not able to purchase the property. So the thing is, you only need the intent to move in. There are cases where some people even just say like they were looking to move into that place, but then they decided not to because maybe uh, their daughter got accepted into a school and they need to be by that school or whatever the reason. If you have proof that you really did have the intent to move there, then you can still use the VA loan for that property. The other thing is like there's no minimum requirement for how long you have to live in the property. If you live there, you move there, you live there, maybe you don't like the neighbors, maybe you don't like the neighborhood that much, you can move out. You can get another property, use the VA loan, rent that one out, whatever it is. 
So I really want to stress that don't be afraid to purchase a property and that you have to live there for two years or one tour or 10 years or whatever it is. You really just have to move there with the intent to be able to move in there as your primary residence. And then after that, it really is your place. If you want to purchase another place, if you want to sell that place, if you want to rent it, you can do that. And then last thing is that you can purchase multiple properties using the VA benefits. So some people believe that you can only use it to purchase one property and that's it. No, you can use it multiple times. You, you have that limit. It is a little bit, it is flexible. You can take it out. You can refinance. You can play around with that money however you see fit. Now, if you have any questions, please leave it in the comments section down below. I'm also going to include uh, my contact information. If you have any real estate related questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, at jmiatsarealestate at gmail.com. I'm a licensed realtor with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Penfund Realty. I, I work out of the DuPont office. Um, but if you have any questions about the VA loan or about military benefits or anything, please, of course, guys, leave it in the comments section. Um, if you're watching this and you're not on the YouTube space, then uh, just feel free to send me an email and let me know any questions that you might have. Again, I'm, I'm all about helping people learn about um, how, to, how, to be, how to better optimize their time and service through saving, investing, maximizing their benefits, trying to help military members uh, like myself to be able to better their time and service, to be able to come out ahead um, just by being smart and, and learning and constantly growing. So if you are looking to purchase home in the near future or have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer your questions. I'd be happy to you know, maybe make more content related to the VA loan as that's something that I really want to do. I want to help military people out in um, being able to purchase their homes, being able to do some uh, housing allowance hacking, whatever, whatever it is. Um, I, I, I enjoy that stuff. So feel free to reach out to me and thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed this training. Let me know if there's any ways that I can improve it and talk to you guys next time.